Hi guys, <coughs> good evening. I am Elon Bowen, online teacher, personal accident dot com for zoology. So we have seen already the diversity among the invertebrate groups, starting from that is the coriferans up to the annelids. Now we will proceed once again the further groups in the invertebrate category. The next one we have phylum Arthropoda. So in terms of number of animals, it is considered as the largest phylum. Nearly two thirds of all animals in this world are being just put under this phylum. So 80% of all animals are coming under this phylum Arthropoda. Hence it is called as actually the largest phylum and also the most successful group occurring in almost all types of environmental conditions cosmopolitan distribution found everywhere and now so as a general rule you know that one these animals are triploblastic bilaterally symmetrical animals and also coming into the category of sizes coelomate because the coelom is developed by the splitting of mesoderm from the mass of mesodermal cells and that too they have different organs and organ systems so we can say the organ system develop organization now out of this group of uh, there is nearly 80% of the animals what I mentioned just actually nearly 70% of the animals nearly 70% of the animals are alone the insects 70% of the animals alone the insect so we have a number of animals coming under this category for example that is a prawn, the insect, the beetles, we have the house flies, etc. So almost all animal groups are coming under this category. So we have actually the animal groups, particularly the insects are occupying nearly 70% of the animal kingdom. So in biodiversity, if we are taking the number of animals, the insects are occupying nearly 70%. The next comes you have for the molluscan animals and other animals we have. In vertebrates, you have for example the fishes, they occupy more number of individuals. So we will be studying more about in biodiversity. And now what are the important characteristics of this group? You see that when the name is given because the legs or the appendages are jointed, arthros, jointed, poda, legs. That is why the phylum name that is arthropoda, the one peculiar character. Now in all cases, you see that when the body is made up of an exoskeleton, any hard material present also the body is considered as an exoskeleton but here the exoskeleton is formed of chitin. chitin so this chitin is nothing but actually a heteropolysaccharide a polymer a heteropolysaccharide a sugary compound but just normally not having any just a sugary taste so it is a heteropolymer an example for heteropolymer and that is that too it is nothing but then glucose amine that is a sugar with the functional amino groups. A sugar with the functional amino groups. The same one also we have for example peptidoglycan in the case of bacteria. The cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan that is also made up of an acetyl glucosamine. The same one this chitin is also an acetyl glucosamine, a heteropolymer, a heteropolysaccharide having the functional group, the amino group. And that question also came, that's this year neat question paper. So chitin contains either sulfur or nitrogen or phosphate etc. It is a nitrogen containing sugar because it contains a functional group that is nitrogen, that is amino group. That is why it is called as a nitrogen containing sugar. So the chitin, a heteropolymer, a sugar just actually of glucose amine, N glucose amine or we can say just N acetyl glucose amine. With the sugar, a functional group of amino, just what is called the amino group. That is why it is an example for nitrogen containing sugar. That question also came in the question paper this year, the question paper. Now, what are the other characteristics? So, normally there is one peculiar phenomenon seen in the case of all insects or in the case of these animal groups during metamorphosis. Normally during development, the development is indirect, there are larval stages, different larval stages in different groups of animals we will see later. For example, the case of uh, housefly, it is called the maggots. In the case of, uh, that is, mosquitoes, it is called ribulus. In the case of beetle, it is called as grub. So like that we have, even you know that on the caterpillar, the larva of, uh, that is butterfly or mass. So these naturally the larval forms are periodically shedding their own cuticle during metamorphosis. 
and also even the adrenal sheds its own cuticle periodically. So the name of the process by which the whole cuticle being shed is called ectasis or molting. Ectasis or molting. A peculiar phenomenon normally seen in the case of all arthropods. So not only in the case of larval forms, but they mean not only in the case of larval forms, but also in the case of other adult forms also we have this ectasis phenomenon. And now this ectasis or molting is under the control of the hormone. The name of the hormone is called what is known as ectasone, a molting hormone. This is otherwise called as a molting hormone responsible for actually that is uh, um, the molting process shedding a molding cuticle that is responsible for metamorphosis process also. During metamorphosis what will happen the larval tissues have been replaced, they are being removed, the cuticle being shed, the animal molds and just one or two times or three times or four times as the case may be. So for example in the case of black insect it molds three times, in the case of silk moth it molds that's four times, in the case of cockroach we have more than six times like that. So the animal molds its whole cuticle either the larva or the adult form and that process called molding or ectasis and that is purely under the control of one hormone what is called ectasone hormone. This hormone is secreted by one gland. So we have a number of glands, endocrine glands, even in the case of insect body, just like human beings. And one such a gland responsible for the secretion of ectoisone is called prothrosic actually gland. So the gland responsible for the secretion of this hormone is called prothoracic gland. The prothoracic gland is localized or located in the prothorax region of the insect. So there is a ectoisone, otherwise called some more hormone. And this molting process or the metamorphosis is also controlled or regulated by another hormone. That hormone is called the juvenile hormone. JK, simply call us the JH. Juvenile hormone. This hormone is secreted by one part of the brain, just like our pituitary, what is called carphora aleta. This is the name of the gland formed just in the brain, responsible for the secretion of this juvenile hormone. Where the ectoisone is responsible for molting process and this juvenile hormone normally inhibits metamorphosis by inhibiting what is called the molting process. So its activities normally just come into effect after the molting process has been initiated. So if the level of this juvenile hormone is more and more, then there is no metamorphosis. The larva molds into larva. There is no conversion of larva into the next stage of what is called the pupal stage. So, you have the concentration, just if you compare the concentration of general hormone, if the concentration is more, at higher level of concentration, then what will happen, you see that one. So, the high level of this JH, when present in the blood, in the case of any insect, the larva molt into larva, the larva molt into larva, so larva to larva larva to larva mode, there is no actually the development of the pupil state. Suppose you have lower level of this DH, it results in actually larva to pupa mode, the next stage will be possible. If this hormone is absent, then only we have the metamorphosis is proceeding, the shedding of body cutie is taking place, the shedding of the larval tissues also from occur because of the effect of the ectisome, then now what will happen? This pupa molds into adult. So lower level normally the pupa. So higher level larva to larva. At lower level larva to pupa. Complete absence of this hormone only the molting process happens, and also metamorphosis is proceeding for the resulting the formation of the adult. So anyway, just actually it exerts its effects only after the molting process has been initiated. Once the molting process or the what is called the metamorphosis has been started, then only its effect or its, it produces its actually effects on that process. So it inhibits metamorphosis. One hormone ectisone promotes metamorphosis and this juvenile hormone or JH the hormone just normally suppresses or inhibits the metamorphosis. The level of these two are responsible for the normal metamorphosis process in the case of arthropods or in the case of insects. Now, so we have the muscles, you know that one the skeletal muscles in the human body, particularly in the case of all vertebrates. And now this is the first group which is developed muscles, that too the striated muscles. 
So we have the muscles, the striped muscles or the skeletal muscles or the voluntary muscles. So those muscles having stripes on them or having striations are considered as a striated muscle. So it is a first group where you have the striated muscles make its origin. So striated muscles appear first time in this category. And these muscles are responsible for the movement of the legs, even for what is called the respiration process, helping the respiration process, etc. So anyway, this is the first group has developed, that is the striated muscles. And so, you have just what is the next category, what is the next character. So I mentioned already the case of one annually, namely just leech. There is a system what is called hemocylomic system. Hemocylomic system or hemocylic system. So what is the meaning for hemocylic system? And normally, just in the case of animals, we have for example earthworm, there is a closed circulatory system. The blood is normally flowing through the blood vessels. In some cases, in peculiar conditions, there are no blood vessels, the blood is simply contained in the body cavity. And such a system is called hemocytic system. Now in the case of all analytes, we have closed circulatory system, the blood is flowing through the blood vessels. But in the case of leech, the blood is contained in the body cavity and that is why it's called a hemocytic system or hemocytic system. Now, here, in the case of all arthropods, the circulatory system is of open type. The circulatory system is of open type. That means there are no blood vessels. The blood is contained in the body cavity. Such a body cavity is called as hemocyl. A cavity containing or filled with the blood is called as what is known as hemocyl. Now, normally mentioned it is a two silomid animal. Anamida, Arthropoda, Mollusca, Echinoda, Metacordata, all are two silomid animals. And based on the development of silom, we call this one as cytosine. But in the case of arthropod, this hemocyl, the body cavity filled with blood, is not considered as a true seal. So it is actually partly developed from what is called the blastocyte, a primary body cavity of the embryo. Primary body cavity of embryo. And it, it is normally developed partly from the silomic sac. Silomic sac. So we have some pouches are found in the cavity and they have been enlarged to form what is called the silomic cavity. But the true silom in these animals are restricted at some places where you have the excreted reproductive systems are formed and there you have small space surrounding them and such spaces surrounding the reproductive system and excreted system they represent the true silomic cavity or true body cavity. So anyway normally in the case of such animals we have the body cavity is there, a true body cavity is there but the true body cavity is very much restricted. That hemocyl is not considered as a body cavity. It is normally partly developed from the blastocyl, the embryonic body cavity or the primary body cavity and also partly from the silomic sac. So that is apt regarding that is a hemocyl or hemocylo in the case of uh, the arthropod animals. Now, so I mentioned that the circulatory system, the open type of circulatory system meaning for that one there are no blood vessels. So we have no blood vessels, not only in the case of arthropods, but also in the case of mollusks and also in the case of echinoderms. So in the last three category, so this phylum is nothing but phylum arthropoda. This phylum is nothing but phylum arthropoda. Okay, we are talking about arthropoda only. We have started from this arthropoda phylum. So we just proceed further. So we are describing about this phylum arthropoda. And now, just the circulatory system is of open type. So normally this type of open system found not only in the case of arthropods but, in, but also in the case of uh, molluscan animals and also echinoderms. In all cases we have the silo is normally that is filled with the blood and that too there are no blood vessels hence we can say the open circulatory system. Okay, so circulatory system is of open type and what is the nature of the blood? So there are no respiratory things. There are no respiratory pigments. If you are taking cockroach, for example, the blood is colorless. Such a colorless blood is called hemolymph. Such a colorless blood is called hemolymph. So we are talking about only the hemolymph, and that hemolymph is a colorless blood found in the case of all arthropods. And normally, 
That means actually there are no respiratory pigments, unlike human beings or unlike earthworms. There you have the respiratory pigment, red color pigment, responsible for the transport of oxygen or carbon dioxide. But again, there is a direct actual respiration. So, what do you mean by direct tissue respiration? There are no blood vessels, there are no respiratory pigments carrying oxygen or carbon dioxide either towards the tissues or from the tissues towards the external media. We have only it is actually that is the oxygen is directly supplied to the tissues through the respiratory system itself for example the tracheal system we will be studying later. A system of branched tubes we have in the case of insects for example tracheal system. And that one is directly supplying oxygen to the tissues and removing carbon dioxide directly from the tissues. This is what we call this one direct tissue respiration. There, there is no role played by the respiratory pigments, but the oxygen and carbon dioxide are being transported directly to the tissues and also to the external medium. Then, so now in some animals, so there are some peculiar cases, in some peculiar cases, we have. The respiratory pigment is formed. So normally you know that one in the case of hemoglobin we have the prosthetic group. Prosthetic group in the form of iron. So that means a non-protein part. But in some arthropods, say an example of crustaceans like prawn, lobster, crabs, etc. And arachnids, for example the spider, scorpion and the each mite, etc. In these cases, the blood is normally blue in color. Blood is blue in color because they contain actually a pigment, a copper containing blue pigment. The name of the copper containing blue pigment is called hemocyanin. Hemocyan. So, a peculiar condition. So, not only in the case of crustaceans and arachnids of this category, that is final arthropoda. In the case of our mollusca also, we have the blood is blue in color. So, we have crustaceans, arachnids and mollusca. These groups of animals have a blue pigment containing copper in it and that is called hemocyanin. That is a peculiar condition. In the case of crab, in the case of lobster, in the case of prawn, in the case of scorpions, in the case of spider, in the case of each mite, in all cases we have the blood is blue in color because of the presence of the blue pigment, a copper containing pigment, what is called hemocyanin. Now, again, uh, this group is always peculiar in most of the characteristics, not only with reference to the nature of the circulatory system, but also with reference to the respiratory organs and also with reference to the excretory organs. That means the respiratory and excretory organs are not uniform in all groups of this arthropod. There are different and different groups of arthropods. Now let us look into the respiratory organs, a peculiar condition. In some cases, we have what are called the blue gills. Blue gills. That means actually the gills are arranged just like the leaves of a book. So when I am using the word gills, it's always you know that one only in the case of aquatic forms. Here the gills are arranged just like the leaves of a book, and hence all book gills. That is seen in the case of one organism, what is called limbless, which belongs to one peculiar group. This limbless normally known as king crab. But no relation between this group, that is this animal, to that of what is called a normal crab. So it is normally known as king crab. Or also called as horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crab. So king crab or horse shoe crab, but not related to a normal crab. So the bone gills are the organs of respiration in the case of limbless. The organism actually will harm more about this organism, a peculiar organism, not only just in terms of its organization, its actually its mode of living. It also based on examination point of view, somewhat important question. Then bone lungs. So when you have actually the lungs which are being formed of many plate-like structure arranged in the form of book as in the case of scorpion and the spider. So we have scorpion and spider and the book lungs, the respiratory organs. Now the spiders not only having the book lungs but also they have additional structure namely the tracheal system, a peculiar condition in the case of our spiders. Spiders have both book lungs and the tracheal system, a branching system of tubes for respiratory process that is seen in the case of spiders. 
So that is about both lungs, scorpion and spiders. Then gills. As a general rule, you know that one in the case of all the aquatic forms we have the gills are branchiae. So they are also named as tinea or lamella. So just like that based on their structure. So here it is called as branchiae gills. As in the case of aquatic animals like prawn, crabs, etc. So we have different types of respiratory organs. You see that one, the book gills, the book lungs and gills. And now the tracheal system I mentioned already is also present in the case of spiders. So in all the insects, in all the centipedes, in all the millipedes, we have the tracheal system, a branching system of tubes responsible for respiratory process. So the respiratory organs are either gills or the book gills or the book lungs or the tracheal system vary in different kinds of arthropod animals. And also, I mentioned already there is a diversity regarding the excretory organs, not actually of the same type, it is not uniform in all cases of animals. Now, it may be coxal glands. So, what do you mean by coxal glands? We are taking actually the leg. See that one normally the legs are fine jointed. We are taking cockroach, we have the basal segment, coxa, then we have just the femur, trochanda, tibia, and tarsus. So, coxa, trochanda, actually the arrangement is like this coxa, trochanda, femur, tibia, and tarsus. So, a five segmented structure, so five jointed actually legs we have in the case of cockroach, if you find. The same one also in the case of spiders. The basal segment of the leg is called coxa. Basal segment of the leg is called coxa. As this respect to the excretory system, the organ is located in the coxa, the gland, hence the name coxal glands. Spiders excrete, that is the waste product by means of coxal glands. Again, there is a peculiarity. Suppose you are taking all the insects, we have the excreted product in the form of uric acid. In all insects, the waste product is uric acid. Is also another question in the case of cockroach. So I am just using in all insects we have uric acid. It is actually an adaptation to conserve water. So animals which are living in dry conditions want to just actually conserve water. They are always excreting uric acid. So the animals are uricotelic animals. Animals are called uricotelic. Now in the case of aquatic animals, normally we have ammonia as a waste product. So in the case of adult frog. In the case of, for example, human beings, we have urea. So, in the case of reptiles and birds, they have uric acid, a type of actually waste product to conserve water. So, it is an adaptation for water conservation. Now, in the case of spider, we have a peculiar waste product. The waste product excreted by spiders are in the form of guanine. So they excrete guanine as the waste product. This is another important characteristic feature of spiders. So they have normally book lungs as well as a tracheal system. Regarding the just actually the excretory system, they have the coxal glands. You know that one they also have the ability of just constructing their web with the help of spinnerets. And that web is made up of a kind of fibrous protein, what is called keratin. Web of spider is made up of a kind of protein, what is called keratin. So keratin is also found in our body. For example, the epidermis of the skin, a fibrous protein. So the coxal gland spiders, which excrete gonin as the waste product, the spider web is made up of a kind of protein, a fibrous protein, what is called a keratin. Now let us go to the next one, green glands. So in the case of Prawn, crabs, lobster. These are all the examples. Prawn, crabs, and lobsters. They have green glands. Based on the color, the glands are called green glands. And based on the location, normally they are found at the base of the antenna. That is why they are also called antennary glands. Antennary glands. They are also called as antennary glands. They are also called antennary glands based on the location, based on the color. And in most cases, for example, in the case of centipede, millipede, and also in the case of insects, we have the peculiar system, what we call this one, malphagian tubules. Malphagian tubules, the organs of excretion in most of the terrestrial 
animals some outer parts. So aquatic animals like the crustaceans, they have the green glands. Now it's toxic plants in the case of spiders. And in the case of spiders also we have just actually the malphagian tubules. So that animal is peculiar, having two types of respiratory organs, having two types of excretory organs, and also excreting a peculiar waste product online. Now what are the sense organs? So whenever you see in animals and want to respond the way these actually they stimuli, they need to have some sensory structures. Now the sensory structures in the case of these animals are the antennae. They are considered as a sensory feelers, sense of touch, an organ of actually what is called tactile sense. If there is any obstruction comes on their way and they are detecting that one and then moving away from the sense of what is called abstraction, sense of touch, tactile sense organs. And also we have simple and compound eyes. Simple and compound eyes. So simple eye, you know that one formed of only one unit. A compound eye is the one which is formed of many small simple units called a materia. The units of compound eye are called a materia. Permetium. Single unit that is called permetium. So, for seeing a single object, the animal uses a number of permetium. That is called what is known as a compound. That means we are using a single lens or single eye to see many objects. Suppose you are taking a human eye, you are closing one eye, you can see many objects by using single eye. But in the case of actually such animals like insect, they have a compound eye being made up of many units. Suppose you are making a section of a, this is actually a compound eye made up of many units. Each square represents a material. So, anyway, normally the animal receives the image when an object is in front of the compound eye. So, each unit receives only a part of a part of actually. The light part of the image normally perceived by that one, the part that is being reflected. So it is this image only a part of an object. So the image formation is nothing but the collective effect of many lenses. If the animal wants to see one full object, it makes use of many lenses. That is what is called actually we can see the mosaic vision. So normally in the case of insect, we have two, we can have two types of visions. One is called superposition, another one appositioning. Superposition image, another one appositioning image. In the case of, for example, cockroach or any other nocturnal insect, the type of image formed is called superposition. That means there is an overlapping of images. We we'll see more about this one because of actually the absence of certain sheet, a black sheet, a curtain is absent. That is why there is overlapping of images. That image form is called superposition image, as in the case of nocturnal animals like cockroach or moth. In the case of diurnal animals, for example, house flies, and also in the case of honeybees, the image form is actually a perfect image. It is not overlapped. That is called opposition. The image formed is nothing but actually the image formed in, an, in, in, in a, a material or in just what is in a compound is nothing but a collective effect of bits of many, a bits of many parts of an object. So each one perceives only part of an object. That is called as a mosaic image. So we can have mainly the mosaic image by the diurnal insect. And also we have superposition image, the overlap image is formed. That image is not actually a clear one, a blurred one. And that is what is called a superposition image. So in the case of cockroach, a nocturnal animal, the type of image form is called superposition. In the case of diurnal animals like what we have is honeybee or housefly, that image is called, that is a, a mosaic image or a position image. So you will see more about later. Then the statosis. Some animals have an organ of balance. They are called as a statosis. Only in some cases we have this structure for balancing the animal while moving. And further we will proceed about the sense organs after the sense organs we have the development. 
So normally in most cases, even say in 100% cases, we have all the sexes are separate, unlike the analytical forms where the sexes are separate. And the male and female animals are different. So we have actually the sexual reproduction, the development in most cases normally indirect. In some cases only direct. So when you have indirect development, always you know that one, remember that one, we have a larval stage. Whenever you have a larval stage in the case of a, an animal group, then the development we can say that is what is called actually indirect development. That means the animal has to pass through a number of stages to get converted into an adult form from the larva to. And now that phenomenon is called metamorphosis. I mentioned already the metamorphosis is controlled by some hormones, what is called the endison hormone, along with regulated by another hormone, namely that is a juvenile hormone. So we have many larval stages in some cases. So you see in the case of for example the aquatic forms like a crab or in the case of prawn we have not placed larva. In the case of I mentioned already the beetles we have grub. In the case of mosquito the larva is normally called as regulus as they exhibit regular movement, regular movement or regular like movement. And in the case of just for example moth and butterfly we have that is a caterpillar. And in the case of false fly, the larval forms are called the magus. So like that we have a number of larval forms. So they have to undergo. But in some cases there is a stage what is called as a nymph stage. Normally the larval form is different from the nymph stage. So the larva is entirely different from its adult. There is no correlation between the adult and the larva. But if you take the nymph, the nymph is nothing but a mini, nothing but a miniature adult, but some of the structure is being absent. For example, the sexual organs are absent, even in some cases, for example, in the case of cockroach, the wings are absent. The wings are absent. They get normally metamorphosed. So the wings are absent, the sex organs are absent. So because of the molting process, the wings are developed and later only the sex organs are developed. So anyway, we have some changes are taking place. The nymph is different from larva. The nymph is somewhat resembling the adult, looking like somewhat adult. Whereas the larva is entirely different from the adult. In both the cases, there are some changes happening, what we call this one, the shedding of the larval tissues, we can say the molting process. So that is what happens during metamorphosis to convert the larva into adult. Now let's see the classification. I mentioned already it is the largest group. And we can have major groups of classification based on the nature of the molecules. In some cases, for example, in the case of scorpion or spider. The first pair of legs are modified into chelicera, some scissor-like structures you can see in the case of crop, the same one also in the case of scorpion, and hence called as chelicerate. But in the case of insect or in the case of for example centipede, millipede or in the case of crustaceans, we have, that is the mouth parts, the mouth parts are used actually for chewing and cutting. So they have mandibles, mainly for cutting and chewing the book. That is why these groups are included under mandibulator. So we can classify it generally Chelicerata and mandibulator. So the group Chelicerata includes one arachnida and also Zephosidura. That's what I mentioned, the king crab. And this mandibulator, the group includes the crustaceans, the insects, centipede, millipede, etc. Now let's see one by one. So here I given only the general classification, not in the broader type. Now, this group is broadly classified into number one class crustacean. All animals are aquatic forms. They have gills. Uh, that is normally the case of one question also came in the question paper. The body consists of cephalothorax and abdomen. Cephalothorax and abdomen. So, normally if you are taking the insect, there are three divisions head, thorax, and abdomen. Head, thorax, and abdomen. But here, the thorax and the head are fused together to form a complicated structure, cephalothorax, and then abdomen. So that is what we have in the case of crab, or in the case of prawn, or in the case of lo the lobsters. And they have gills as an organ of excretion. And another peculiar character, this group has normally two pairs of antennae. Sensory feelers, they have two pairs. So normally they have two pairs of antennae. And if you are taking the mouth parts, they have a pair of mandibles, a pair of mandibles. And also they have two pairs of pants. The main character, they have just actually two pairs of antennae. 
Even in the case of these animals, the eyes are placed on a stalk. The eyes are placed on a stalk, elevated stalk. So that type of eye is called what is called permetophore. Permetophore. If the eyes are placed, if the eyes are placed on actually, if the eyes are placed on a stalk-like structure, then it is called permetophore. And one just one one question came from that one just actually posted. So oviparous means animals which are laying eggs. The egg laying conditions is called oviparous condition. For example, the birds are oviparous animals. Then we have the frogs are oviparous animals. The insects are oviparous animals. Because the animals lay eggs. So the egg laying animals, the condition of egg laying is called what is known as oviparous condition. Now coming back to the examples. So we have the prone. So the freshwater prawn is called palema and the marine and the marine prawn is called pinnaeus. Then now that you know that one cancer, the word is used for crab. That is the word for crab cancer. And then this one, an animal having the name of fish but not a true fish. Just like an insect, for example, lepisma, silver fish, it is an insect, not a fish. Then devil fish, cuttlefish. So, crayfish. So, again, I mentioned one word crayfish. So, it is a crustacean, the anstracus, having the name of a fish, but not a true fish. Then, just actually, if you are taking the mouth parts of any arthropod, the mouth parts include just the mandibles used for cutting, toothed edges. The mandibles are actually chitinous structures having toothed margins for cutting and chewing. Then the maxillae are five jointed structures with the some more additional structures present along with mouth parts. So if you are taking the mouth parts, they include a pair of mandibles. Then long process what are called a pair of maxillae. A pair of maxillae. Then we have upper lip what is called the labrum and the lower lip what is called labium. And also we have the tongue. So these five structures together constitute the mouth parts of insect or arthropod. And now these maxillae are the structures, actually the part structures, they have the arrangement like this. These are all the structures. This is the maxilla located on either side. So that if you are taking the mouth parts of any insect or any arthropod, we have a pair of mandibles, the two three edges structures, chitinous structures having two three edges like this. This is what is called mandible. For cutting, just like teeth. Just like your teeth use for cutting and chewing. And for grasping the food items, for holding the food items, actually we have this maxillae. Some elongated structures, five jointed structures having the base of two segments. They are called maxillae. And also we have, for example, upper lip, lower lip. Upper lip is called labrum and lower lip is called labium. And also a tongue like structure, hypharynx. So these are all parts of actually structures found in mouth parts of any arthropod. Then saccolina, this is an crustacean. So it is normally not having any crustacean characters, any arthropod characters, just like the segmentation presence of joint legs. It is just like a mass attached to the body of a crab. Even changes the sex of the crab from male to female like that. So that is about the parasitic crustacean. So remember this one, an animal having the name of fish but not a true fish, that is astracus, normally called a crayfish. Now types of mouth parts. I mentioned earlier. So the mouth parts represent what we call this one analogous organs or homologous organs like that. So in evolution we have just for example homologous and analogous organs. Some organs have same origin, same fundamental pattern but perform different functions. Same origin, same fundamental pattern but perform different functions. For example, if you take the following skeleton of all vertebrates, birds, bats, horns, human beings, even what is called actually the flipper of whale. So all are having the basic fundamental structure if you take upper arm, forearm and then hand. But they are variously modified. In the case of whale or dolphins, the flipper is used for swimming. In the case of horse, it is used for running. In the case of birds, it is for flying. In our case, we are using for different purposes. So such organs having same origin but perform different functions are called homologous organs. So the mouth parts of insect are examples for homologous organs. Homologous organs.
and also they are exhibiting what is called evolutionary divergence or exhibit divergent evolution. What is the meaning of divergent evolution? We have one ancestral type. From this ancestral type having common origin, different structures have been but the basic fundamental structure is the same, origin is the same. For example, likewise here in the case of mouth parts, we have different types of mouth parts. In all mouth parts, we have the same basic structure, but differently modified or variously modified. It's an example. If you are taking the mouth parts, we have mandible, maxilla, I mentioned already, labrum, labium, and also hypopharynx. But they are modified based on their function. So, they have same origin but perform different functions, hence the mouth parts of actually the arthropods an example for homologous organs in contrast to analogous organs. For example, if you are taking the wing of an insect and wing of a bird, they have different origin. The insect's wing is different in structure and origin from that of the wings of bird. And such organs having different origin, but they are performing one common function. What is the function actually? The flight. And that is why they are considered as the analogous organs. So organs having same origin, but different function are called homologous organs. Organs having different origin, but perform same function are considered as analogous organs. Example, the wing of insect and the wing of bird. Now coming back to this one. So anyway, the mouth pass example for homologous organs. So we have the following types of organs. Now in the case of cockroach or in the case of grasshopper, we have biting and chewing type. This is a type of organs. Now in the case of actually the bees and bats, they are chewing and lapping type, licking type, lapping type. And a peculiar mechanism is seen in the case of houseplay, they have a spongy type of actually mouth parts. Just actually there is a structure the animal normally just like using their structure and absorb that one just like a sponge and then it is normally feeding that liquid food. Normally, housefly feeds mainly the liquid food by using what is called sponging type of mouthpass. Now, the siphoning type, you can see there is a coiled structure, a tubular structure kept coiled, you can see in the case of butterflies and mass. And these structures are nothing but long proboscis, a siphon, a tubular structure for taking the honey from the base of the flower and such a type is called siphoning tongue. Now in the case of mosquito, so it is normally piercing actually our body or the animal's body and sucking, sucking the blood. So that one is called piercing and sucking type as in the case of mosquitoes. So these are all some of the types of mouth parts that are very easily modified and considered as homologous organs. Now let's go into some of the insects which are economically important. So the animal kingdom, if you are taking the invertebrate group, so the phylum cylindrata because they have the corals, phylum arthropoda because they have three insects. You see that one, the honeybees, we have the silk moth and also the lab insect. And in the case of mollusca, we have for example the pears are produced by the pear oyster. That is why these three groups, namely the cylindrata, arthropoda and the mollusca groups are considered as economically important groups as we are getting some valuable materials from these groups. Now let us take three insects which are highly valuable coming under the category, economically important category. Now the first one, Apis indica. So the honeybee dance, you know that one Apis indica it is being reared for getting honey. And they have just actually for communication, they exhibit some kinds of dance to show the direction of actually the honey, where is it there? That's how long actually it is there from the place of the honeycomb. And that is what is called honeycomb, honeybee dance. That honeybee dance was first actually disappeared by Carl von Fritz. And because of that one, he was awarded Nobel Prize also, honeybee dance. So, the honeybee dance is for communication. They are communicating where is honey located, which direction it is located, how far it is being actually located from its honey. So, that is about APC because the honeybee dance. Now, what is the type? You see that one we are using honey as a substitute. In the case of children who are unable to digest normal sugar. So, what is the reason for that one? 
Normally, the honey contains sugars like levulose and dextrose, easily digestible sugar, and also medicated sugar, and that is being found in the case of honey. And what is its economic importance? You know that one. So normally the honey is used as a substitute in our Ayurvedic medicine. In so many medicines we are using that one because the levulose and dextrose never also increase the blood sugar level and also used as a medicine, the one which can be digested by children. Now the second one, the vena, see the honeybee vena, that is used normally in the treatment of arthritis. Arthritis, the inflammation of the tongue. Persons are unable to just fold their actual limbs because some problem in the knee joint, different types of actual arthritis. Arthritis is nothing but the inflammation of the joints. Then also it is being used as an anti-venom to treat the snake bite. So the anti-venom, it is being prepared from that is what is called actually the venom of honeybee. It is being used against snake bite. This is one. Now let us take another insect more mix more the one man, what is called actually you know that one so the honeybee the rearing of honeybees for getting honey is called apiculture the rearing of honeybees actually by honey actually the rearing of honeybees for getting honey is called apiculture so apiary is a place where all the honeybee forms are available apiary the honeybee forms high bee high you know that one just there you have actually we have the comb the honeycomb where you have just the compartments for holding or for just actually providing accommodation for the three different types of honeybees. You see that one queen, at least only one queen in a honeybee colony, and then many workers and also a few males are the drones. Now, the bombix mori is normally called the Chinese silk worm moth. So, the rearing of bombix mori. And also the extraction of silk from that is what is called its cocoa is called a sericulture, just like the apicultures is also called what is known as sericulture. So normally the honeybee culture is affected by one protozoan parasite, what is called nozema. This is a parasitic protozoan which causes damage not only to that is what is called the honeybee colony but also to the silk moth. This nosema causes what is called nosemia disease in the case of honeybee and febrine disease. Febrine disease in the case of silk moth. So nosema disease, actually nosemia disease, the nosema, that is the name of the parasite, causes nosemia disease in the case of actually honeybee <coughs> and febrine disease in the case of silk moth. Now we'll see some more about the silk moth. So, here in the case of silk moth, the number of moles is equal to 4. So, actually between two successive moles, there is an interval period. So, the interval period between two successive moles is called as an instar. So, this is one mole, the second mole. So, the interval period between two successive moles is called as instar. So, instar is the name given between, actually an interval period between two successive moles. So suppose you want to know <coughs> how many instars you have. So the number of instars is equal to the number of moles minus 1. Suppose you have there are 4 moles in this case, we have only 3 instars. So number of instars is equal to number of moles minus 1. Now, we are getting this silk thread. So it is normally obtained from, that is a cocoon. The cocoon, the one which is being constructed by Actually, the caterpillar by using its what is called the spinnerets, and the silk is normally produced by the silk gland. It is nothing but a secretion of the silk gland. It's a modified, actually, a salivary glands in the case of caterpillar. So, the silk gland secrete what is called the silk. Now, normally, the original or natural silk is nothing but a protein. It is made up of a tough fibrous protein, what is called fibroid. So many such active threads being bound together by means of another sticky protein, what is called sericin, to form a silk. So the natural fiber, that synthetic one is different from this one, it can differentiate whether the silk is natural or synthetic. So a natural silk, for example, the fine point, when placed in, for example, a protein-like enzyme, it is being digested. 
when you are placing for example a synthetic activity silk in proteolytic cancer any proteolytic cancer it is not being digested by which we can identify whether the silk is original natural or artificial or synthetic so anyway actually the silk thread is formed of fibroid protein and many silk threads are bound together to form the silk thread and that is by means of sin another protein a sticky protein now so the culture what i mentioned the sericulture the rearing of silk mark and actually they extract the silk from the cocoon and that field of industry is called what is known as sericulture now you know that one china is the first place in the production of the silk in our country we have produced more silk in karnataka state the state having more silk production is karnataka state and just the country which is the first place in silk production is nothing but china so this is a second insect we are getting actually the valuable life that is a silk fiber from this one the third useful and economical insect nothing but the laxifer lacca or tacardia lacca normally called as a lac insect so it has two names actually this is a old name laxifer lacca this is the tacardia lacca the new name now in this case actually the name moles three times number of moles three so we have the number of instars falling two so i mentioned all the body in by instar the time interval will be two successive mode the time interval will be two successive modes suppose for example this is the first mode this is the second mode this is the third mode and this is the fourth mode now within two modes there is an interval period and that interval period between the two successive modes is called as instar time interval between two successive modes is called as an instar so for example if you have there are four modes that number of instars 1 2 and 3 so in the case of just actually the silk moth i mentioned there are four modes so we have the number of instars for the three and in the case of this laxical larva we have just normally three modes so the number of instars is equal to 2 so anyway the time interval between these two modes is called an instar now the laxical larva now this lac is nothing but a resinous product lac is nothing but a resinous product and that one is secreted by actually one gland present in the skin of the female namely the hypogonadal glands present below the epidermis and it is making a cocoon this cocoon is normally there is resinous that resin like substance it produces that is this actually unlike for example the silk cocoon it is normally hard and up secreted by the hypogonadal glands of skin of female now the lock that is happening with the being purified or refined is called as raw lock and that is also called as stick lock raw lock or stick lock and the one which is refined purified is called as shell lock and as far as india is concerned normally it is the largest actually lock producing country in the world we are the largest lock producing country in the world now some of the insects also act as vectors you know the meaning of vector the disease transmitting agents so in the case of arthropods we have a number of insects responsible for causing actually the tropical diseases now we know that when the insects are multiplying more and more in tropical countries because they have the ability to multiply in such a temperature in large numbers so we have a number of vectors for example the first one female anopheles mosquito you know that one is a vector for the parasite plasmodium in the malaria parasite the next one the female culex pipiens or another species also pipiens and this is a vector for filarial worm the one which causes filariasis or elephantiasis so female culex pipiens So normally, you know that one only the female mosquitoes are the transmitting agents. The reason for that one, they have modified mouth parts. The mouth parts get modified into a needle-like structure, what is called as a proboscis. That proboscis being used for piercing and sucking the blood. But in the case of me, what will happen? There is no such modification, so that they cannot have the ability of sucking the blood. That is why the males are not able to transmit the disease. so most of the vectors are sanguivorous mode of feeding they are sanguivorous blood eaters but normally the males are feeding on the plant juice or the plant sap because they do not have modified mouth parts to suck the blood that is why they cannot have the ability of actually transmitting the disease 
even they are not acting as a vector as per the animal's concern. Now we have the female Aedes aegypti, another mosquito, the third group of mosquito, the one responsible for actually transmitting the yellow fever and dengue fever caused by the virus. So unlike the first two, normally these two mosquitoes, namely the female Anopheles and female Culex, they lay their eggs in water. But this one is normally lays its egg on moist soil. So there is a main difference between these two. There are some other vectors. Now Glossina pulpalis is normally called as a sex supply, the dangerous one found most abundant in Africa, responsible for transmitting Trypnosoma gambiense. The one which causes the disease what is called African sleeping sickness. Then also we have another one, Lepidomus. This is normally called as a sand fly for actually causing a disease Leishmania, Leishmaniasis. So we have visceral Leishmaniasis or skin Leishmaniasis. We have just two different types of Leishmania. For example, and just one is Leishmania tropica, another one Leishmania donovani, and both are acting as parasites, protozoan parasites being transmitted by Flavidomus. Even also another one, Tritoma, another one, a vector, Tritoma, a bug. So this one transmits normally another species of Trypnosoma, what is called Trypnosoma cruzi. Trypnosoma cruzi that is being transmitted by Tritoma species of an insect that is a bug. This one causes a disease, what is called Chaga species. So, anyway, these are all some of the insects actually acting as vectors for transmitting the disease. Now, also, we have pest. The gregarious pest. What is the meaning for gregarious? The animals which are coming in large numbers. The animals which are coming always in flocks, in groups, and such insects are called gregarious insects. So, one insect, we have the largest grasshopper named the locust. So it's always coming in swamps and just within a second they just harvested the entire field of more than 100 acres. Such so huge numbers they are coming, they are always living in groups and that is called a gregarious pest. And now suppose you compare for example, if you are taking the insect, moth is related to butterfly. Then housefly, you see that one dragonfly is related to damselfly and the grasshopper is related to what we call this one, that is a locust, grasshopper, a type of large grasshopper. Now we completed the crustacea class, we completed what we have that is insect class. Now, class number 3 and class 4, I am just comparing. Now this class Chylopoda includes Colopeta, nothing but the centipede. Then class Diplopoda includes namely what is called the millipede, the scientific gillus. So what is the meaning of Chylopoda? And each segment we have only one character. See that one I mentioned. That is why the group is called Chylopoda. But in the case of Diplopoda, the meaning Diplo, you know that one Poda means each segment has two pairs of legs. That is why this animal has a number of legs. Hence, the group is called thousand legged animals. And here it has only limited number of legs. That is why it is called actually hundred legged animals. That also the name is given centipede. Not exactly hundred, but they have. Here, merely many. So many legs, and here about about 100 legs. Then another comparison, what is the difference? The first difference, each segment has one pair of legs and here each segment has two pairs of legs. Then the centipede is always poisonous and this one is non-poisonous. And regarding the food habit, normally the centipedes are carnivorous and the millipedes are herbivorous. Carnivorous and the herbivorous. And if you are taking the position of the genital aperture, the genital aperture is normally located at the posterior end. This is what is called ophistogonate type. And here in the case of millipede, the genital aperture is present near the mouth. This is what is called progonate type. And now in the case of actually this millipede, all the mouth parts are joined together to form a compound structure. Joined together to form a compound structure. That structure is called nathokylanium, which is nothing but a masticated structure responsible for mastication, a peculiar structure formed in the case of NP. So just this is a comparison between the two classes and also their characteristic features. Now the class 0 I mentioned that is limulus, it has many characteristics. 
It's commonly known as, it's of uh, also examination point of view important. It's normally called as fossil crab or the king crab. It is called as a living fossil. You know fossil means the remains of the fossil. So the living fossil means an animal which has remained unchanged over millions of years. This animal formed more than two or three million years back and it has characteristics what it had when it was born in this world. So without any change, the characters are present as such. That is why it is also a living fossil, just like a living legend. And now it is also considered an animal which refused evolution or which does not respond to evolution. The meaning for that one, in evolution normally change. But here there is no change occurred in this animal anyway. That is why the animal remains as such what it had when it was normally originated in this world. That is why it is called as a living force. For example, here the last group Arachnida. And normally what peculiar character in the case of scorpions and the spiders, we don't have any antenna. The antenna has. And mentioned already the anterior appendages are modified into the cell used for capturing the prey. We have examples, for example, Hitchcock Metra Scorpion, a peculiar one. So it shows vivid parrot. It gives birth to M1. Once the M1 are fully developed, the dorsal valve, the dorsal side of the body, the actually the female ruptures and releasing the M1, the female dies. That is happening in the case of Hitchcock Metra. Then spider. Arania, I mentioned all that the bone and excreted product. They have also been made up of keratin. They have book lungs as well as we have also the tracheal system. Now, this is of economic importance. Sarcoptus scabiae. The species name Sarcoptus scabiae. Because it produces one skin disorder, what is called scabies. The skin disorder, scabies, is produced by actually the Sarcoptus. That's why it's called speech mind. Even present on our body surface externally. So a scabies disorder is caused by sarcoptus, a kind of itch mind. So these are some of the characters related to the largest group what we have named this arthropoda. With this I conclude this group. Let's proceed with some more groups later in the next class. So I am relieving you. And if you have any question, you can post it just online. We will answer it. Thank you.